Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this April's Climate Live K-12 session for students, educators, and the public, a series brought to you by the Columbia Climate School. My name is Laurel Zimashihi, and I lead K-12 and continuing education programs at the Columbia Climate School, and I will be facilitating today's session. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Climate School or joining us for the first time, the Climate School is a newly established school at Columbia University for transdisciplinary climate research. The school marshals the university's strengths in basic and applied disciplines and expands its resources to understand climate and its impact on society, develop and inspire knowledge-based solutions, and educate future leaders for just and prosperous societies on a healthy planet. This is the first new school at Columbia in 25 years, so we are extremely excited about its launch. Um, and it incorporates more than 20 different centers with over 750 people who collaborate among many departments of the university um, that allow us to better connect, amplify, and advance new areas of climate inquiry, research, and impact across Columbia and beyond. So what we are hoping to do with these Climate Lab K-12 sessions um, it's to introduce you all to the interdisciplinary work through our scientific experts. So these are monthly sessions that are run throughout this 2023-2024 academic year. Um, our last session in this academic year is in June. So just keep that in mind. We only have a few sessions left before summer. If you'd like any more information about these sessions, you can visit our website that I will put in the chat, or you can contact me directly at learn at climate.columbia.edu. Each week we focus on a certain topic and we will um, also share what age range this topic is best suited for. So for today's session entitled Introduction to Green Spaces, Build Your Own, um, we are going to be talking about how there's this really important connection between green spaces and environmental justice. So today you're going to hear from Rashawn Merchant, who is a Columbia Climate School uh, Climate Society alum alumni and a current PhD student at Teachers College to learn about the many benefits of green spaces and how you can build your own with houseplants. So um, we're really excited about that. A few housekeeping things. Um, we encourage questions throughout the session, so please use the Q&A box at the bottom to put in questions as soon as they pop in your head, and we'd be happy to spend time answering them at the end. Um, the chat is disabled, so please use the Q&A box instead. All right, without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Rishan. Hi, everyone. Laura, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, before I begin, I definitely have to give my many thanks to Laurel and all of the team at uh, the Columbia's Climate School um, just for providing me this opportunity today to speak with you all. Um, like Laurel already mentioned, my name is Rashawn Kamari Merchant. Um, I am a past alumni of the Climate Society Master's Program. Currently, I'm pursuing my PhD in science education as well. Um, and a very special and near dear place in my heart is uh, environmental justice, which uh, we'll definitely get a lot into today. Um, so we have about 30 minutes. We're speaking, I'm gonna be speaking from four to 4.30. Um, so hopefully uh, I'll get through this in a decent amount of time and that way we can have some questions at the end. Um, but if everyone is ready to get started today, um, I can go ahead and I'll share my screen and get started with the presentation. That sounds great. Okay, you all should see my slides at this point. And I will go ahead and begin. All right, everyone. So today um, I will be giving you all an introduction on green spaces and discussing how exactly green spaces intersect and have the intersectionality regarding environmental justice and the current movement around building and providing environmental justice for communities. So, the main point of topics of today is what are green spaces? Um, as climate change continues, green spaces in general have just become a growing topic. Um, and as we continue to do more work improving on climate change, obviously it will be something that you hear more and more of. So essentially green spaces are any type of area that can first and foremost be used for recreation or conservation, and it is covered by vegetation. So. Green spaces can range anywhere between a large farmland to a park 
or even down to a single individual tree walking along a uh, city space. Now, what are the benefits of green spaces, right? Like this is these are the ideas of why um, we talk about this so much and why we understand um, why green spaces can be useful, right? So number one, nature scientifically has calming and stress reducing effects on humans, right? Um, think about this in the context of, you know, whenever you meditate, whenever you're getting ready to fall asleep, you know, with some people put on like rain sounds or like sounds of the rainforest, right? Because nature is healing to us. So just by having a green space in your area, you would automatically receive the benefits of health, um, which a lot of times you might not get from, you may not get from other sources that are natural, right? Um, second, exercise. In the, gen in the context of America, almost all American sports take place on some type of field, right? Um, on Tuesday, right here in New York City, it was just 75 degrees. The first thing I noticed were all of the people running and using parks and recreational spaces um, to get the exercise on or playing, you know, soccer or just being outside and having activity. Third, green spaces do a lot for the environment in terms of providing green, uh, biodiversity. Um, biodiversity in the context of they allow birds to be able to inhabit trees. Um, we know that bees are able to take place and have flowering opportunities. Or even um, green spaces can be considered zoos where a bunch of, an abundance of animals, um, which normally live, wouldn't live in an area, can take place and uh, take hold. And then last but not least, temperature regulation. So moving forward with climate change, we talk a lot about how trees and shrubbery are great at reducing temperature, which I'll discuss a lot more um, into these slides. But what people also don't know is that trees can also provide us with warmth in the wintertime. And what I mean by this is, imagine it's a snowy, very windy day. Um, in certain areas, if you have an abundance of trees, those trees actually do a really great job at stopping those winds and stopping those heavy, harsh winter times from blowing and causing us more distress. Um, so overall, green spaces provide a plethora of benefits. So these are some of the good things, but what actually is the problem or the situation that is occurring with green spaces, right? And the key word is right here on the screen, it is accessibility. Unfortunately, with climate change and with climate and with environmentalism, we're starting to notice that as we promote, you know, some of these healthy and natural benefits, Unfortunately, not all people have access to these green spaces, right? Um, unfortunately, due to race or socioeconomic factors, including maybe gender or income disparities, studies show that green spaces in and of themselves are a luxury item, right? Um, and without having access to green spaces, people who are oftentimes most in need don't have the access that they would usually have to having um, proper or you know, positive health effects, right? So you have this compounding effect when people don't have access to green spaces because unfortunately, these natural stress factor, these natural stress releases, you know, they just won't have access to them, right? So um, I'll just be giving you all a couple examples and how those discrepancies have come about, right? And this is this is a big one right here, right? I put up this study um, that the New York Times had conducted. And what it essentially says is, in August of the year 2021, on the exact same day, researchers under the New York Times went out and they did temperature readings on a street in Central Park. And a street on the same day in Central Park measured 84 degrees. But across town in East Harlem, streets reached upwards of 115 degrees. So this is a 30 degree difference in the same exact day almost the exact same time. Now, researchers wanted to know why, like what are the differences between these streets? Well, you ever walk alongside Central Park West or the East Side, all along these streets is nothing but tree lines and an abundance of vegetation, right? But unfortunately, when you walk across areas like East Harlem, you don't see the same amount of tree vegetation, right? In some places in Central Park West, you can have tree coverage of up to 50%. But in places like East Harlem, sometimes you can have tree line coverage less than 10. 
And a lot of times these will look like the small, tiny trees that don't even have much of an abundance of leaves growing on them. And those, unfortunately, aren't going to do as much um, to, to reduce the temperatures in the community, right? And so scientists now, you're starting to see that when summer times do hit, 115 degrees is not a is not a healthy is not a healthy situation for people to normally live in, especially because we have things like that already exist, such as you know urban heat island effects, where we know that in cities temperatures will be warmer because of all of the concrete and buildings that are taken up and absorbing all of the radiation and, and trapping the heat inside of the cities, right? Um, so unfortunately, we start to see people ending up hospitalized or facing illnesses such as heat illnesses or heat related strokes and faints um, because they live in neighborhoods that don't have as much um, tree line coverage or access to parks and, and vegetation for them to be able to cool themselves down. All right. So moving along. So some of the discrepancies with green spaces, um, of course, are related to historical context. Something that I want you all to pay attention to well beyond this presentation is this term redlining. Redlining refers to the historical segregation which placed limits on neighborhood funding and resources. So a long time ago, especially, actually is not that too long ago if you think about it. Um, some of our grandparents and parents were actually alive during the time when redlining occurred. Um, and it's this time period pre and post World War II where city planners and government officials themselves actually determined that some areas and some neighborhoods were deemed more valuable for you to put your funding and put your welfare towards. So in the context, um, give an example again, a place like Central Park West was highlighted in green as saying, you know, we should spend tons of money here. We should build parks and green spaces because these people are worthy and deemed valuable enough to have these accesses. But in places like the South Bronx or maybe in, in some areas like Newark, where you tend to see a lot of factories, well, this was designed purposely. Neighborhood and city planners already determined that these neighborhoods weren't as fit or, or capable of being worth the investment. So a lot of times you end up having places where instead of parks, where they would decide, oh, actually, instead of a green space or some trees, you can actually put factories. Um, and this has caused long-term effects into what we see in the present day. Um, so it's not it's not like it just fabricated out of thin air. Um, unfortunately, redlining is a product of government planning. Um, but let's talk about in the modern context, right? So unfortunately, as well, there's affordability that comes into play with green spaces. So the current cost for green space construction can be kind of pricey um, just because, you know, there are so many issues going along with tax dollars or um, just government spending, spending and things like that too. And then again, um, I'll, I'll speak a lot about New York today, of course, that's because where Columbia is located, but for my New Yorkers or, and people around the world who may have seen this too, you know, anyone who lives in a big city can tell you this, there just isn't as much space left. Um, when you walk around, a lot of times, a lot of the lots are already filled. And if they're not filled, there's a higher chance of a 50 story building going up as opposed to um, a patch of grass, just because in the context of economics and city planning, you know, we tend to think about the economic benefit as opposed to the natural benefit, right? And this, this, has, also, this has also increased the problem with climate change in general. Uh, and a great example I can give of sometimes, even when we do have green spaces, sometimes there can still be discrepancies based on how, because of maybe the location of the specific park or green space, um, you might have some issues with how that green space is actually being upkept. So, and then there are some cases where that green, that green space itself can cause negative benefits on the community, right? Um, and a great example I wanna give, and especially people native to the Columbia area, you, as you all know, the gem of ours, uh, Morningside Park, um, there are actually some challenges with this park, right? And I'll give you a context based off of this map. So this map shows highlighted in green on the west side of the park, we know Columbia University is around this area, but on the east side of the park, historically, 
much of Harlem and Harlem residents live um, on the east side in this section along, I believe that'd be Morningside Avenue. So the problem with Morningside Park is because a lot of times, in a, mo in a lot of cases, people have given the context of since Morningside has some connections to, you know, the east side in the Harlem area, um, unfortunately, the park hasn't been upkept and maintained um, to the best of its ability, right? Um, whether that be due to a lack of resources or just a lack of staff members to upkeep the park, um, there have been discrepancies in terms of, you know, maybe just seeing a little bit more unsightly trash. Um, we start to see as well, because parks themselves are already valuable, um, people still consider it a valuable area to live. So we have some of the impacts of gentrification, which is kind of indicating to us that for the people who have been longstanding residents of this area and who have in the past historically have enjoyed access to this park, they're actually being unfortunately priced out and move and are most and probably moving into areas um, where they no longer have the park access space, right? Because the park is a luxury. And again, a great example I could give of this is, you know, um, for you all who are familiar with the area, think about how expensive it is to live next to Central Park, right? Living next to green spaces are a luxury because of the benefits that they provide. Um, so it's especially, especially important to pay attention to that. And then last but not least, Morningside Park has a very gorgeous pond. Um, but because of some of the maintenance issues um, and just because of some of the lack of care due to the parks, uh, we see that in that pond, um, there have started to grow a lot of algae blooms, right? Um, in low numbers, algae is fine, but in high numbers, as you can see in this park uh, picture right here on the right side with the ducks in the green water, um, too, many, too much of algae can cause disruptions to water ecosystems. So unfortunately, they can cause fish kills or even cause respiratory issues to humans. Um, and this picture specifically came from uh, Columbia University's work to kind of restore and, and complete more research on how we can upkeep and build the park, right? So this is a great example of how sometimes even if you do have a park, you know, you still do have to take proper precautions to take care of um, and properly upkeep it, right? Um, so I discussed a lot of benefits and problems with you all, but essentially, of course, with everything related to climate change and environmentalism, uh, we always want to look towards solutions and we always want to look towards the future. So I asked this question to you all and we'll provide you all some examples of what exactly are the things that we can do, right? Um, so first and foremost, please, everyone, we all have some sort of local community le leader, whether it's a councilman, an assemblyman, assembly person, um, some sort of representative. There are people who represent us and these are the people who we can reach out to to discuss providing and building access for us to have green spaces, right? Um, and if you see on this first bullet point, I said reach out to politicians to, to discuss inclusionary green spaces. Now, I especially want to highlight the word inclusionary because I've noticed sometimes you might have a park, but we do need to take more care into consideration of people who are disabled, right? Um, let's think about a park that may be especially hilly or may have an abundance of stairs. Um, in the future, as we start to build, as we start to build green spaces, um, we need to consider people who may not have as much accessibility walking, right? Someone in a wheelchair may not have as much easy access utilizing a set of stairs, right? These are these are things in these these are forward um, thinking ways that we need to move on with. And another one is, I mentioned to you all earlier how we don't, in big cities, we don't have as much access to like empty lots anymore. So we're starting to see kind of innovative ways of like, we might to see more green spaces built on roofs. Literally, they're called green roofing. Um, but a lot of times you will only see these, these uh, green spaces built in luxury apartments, right? Um, and again, it's not benefiting the people who have the greatest need who already don't even have a park or, or, or a space to access to in the first place. Um, so moving forward, since uh, we are speaking in terms of like academia and institutions, I see it's very it's become very popular now where schools um, or local community groups are participating more and more in park cleanups. So this is a great way to have maintenance. And it's a great way to get yourself involved in maintaining and cleaning up a park or a space that's close to you. 
And then last but not least, starting your own green space, right? A lot of the, a lot of the even advice I can give you all, you know, communicating with local leaders or attending park cleanups, they can be very time consuming and very energy consuming. So I wanted especially to end off on just announcing to you all, you know, sometimes it's up to us as individuals to make change, right? Um, to make a big difference or an impact in the world. Sometimes all it takes is one and sometimes that one is just you. Um, so great pace, a great way to have green spaces is including them into your own house by utilizing indoor house plants and having uh, gardening practices, right? Um, and I just wanted to finish off with you all today. Um, I actually stopped sharing my screen to go ahead and do this. Um, I actually just wanted to have a quick show and tell because I myself, um, as I've as I've grown as an environmental adjacent person, it's been very important to me to start to have you know my own collection of uh, greenhouse adjacent plants and everything, um, so I can keep you know the nature and healing effects into my own home into my own environment, right? Um, so what I want to do with you all today is to show you all three varieties of plants, which I feel are the type of plants where everyone can can own and maintain. Um, they're all very low maintenance. And I'll just start showing you all uh, those today. So just give me one second to grab them real quick. They're just right next to me, so I'll grab them. Um, so right here, I have one. So this plant... I've been trying to practice the name all day. This is a Dracaena, a Dracaena, right? Um, Dracaenas are very, very great plants to have because, again, they don't take much to maintain. This is the type of plant. It's great for all conditionings, whether you have a lot of light in a room, whether you have low partial shade, um, it'll grow well. And this one in particular, I really wanted to bring out um, because it's special to me because I only got it for $5, right? Um, a lot of times we... You know, in the context of environmental justice, a lot of us have other things to spend money on. But I just want to let you guys know it doesn't take much to, to buy a plant. And I got this one for five dollars because um, it has some damage to it when the store was selling it. But as it's grown and as I've been able to maintain it, you know, you can't even really see how much it's been. It's, it's been able to bounce back pretty well. Um, so I feel like I've been doing a great job with it. Uh, second, just continue on for time. I have this fig tree. So figs, figs are really, really good, especially for people who don't have, I'll show the whole thing, um, who don't have access to a lot of light in their apartments, right? Sometimes we may not have an east or west facing window, not getting that morning or afternoon sun. Um, so we, we just need plants that are able to adapt or can, can thrive in low, in low lighting situations. And a good thing about the fig is, is, and like other plants, unlike other plants, instead of in growing wide, it grows vertical, so you don't need a lot of space to maintain it, okay? Uh, so third and last and third but not least, I have this, this succulent right here. Um, I especially want to highlight this one. Um, my partner actually gave this one to me. Um, so not only is it a succulent, which means that it's a desert plant, this is a type of plant where if you don't water it for an entire month, right? Like I said, a lot of us are busy. A lot of us have other things going on with the time you can leave it for an entire month and it will literally grow and still be able to maintain itself with no problem at all. Except with these, you do need a little bit of light with them um, because of course it is a desert-based plant. But I think it's special. Um, you know, like I said, it was given to me, it was gifted to me. And I think on a deeper level, it kind of just, uh, it kind of represents the idea of togetherness with green spaces, right? Um, the point of having community and shared spaces is that we are in this together. Uh, we need to be together in terms of climate change and environmentalism. Um, and it should be something that we all can take part in fairly and equitably, right? So, you know, if you ever want to share the gift of having a green space with someone else, um, please buy someone a plant. You know, you never know how much it, it, can, it can impact someone um, and how much it can have a positive, uh, have positive benefits on their lives, you know? Uh, so that's really all I have for you all today. Thank you all so much for your time. And Laurel, can we please, um, we can go ahead with some questions. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing. This mm -hmm. is amazing. I learned a lot. I have a um, a fig tree myself and um, I thought it looks a little unhappy and I thought maybe it was because it's not getting enough sun, but it's good to know that they don't need that much sun. So it must be something else. <laughs> <laughs> 
So we have a question in the chat. It's um from Samuel who asks, can you explain green gentrification and how urban tree can canopies can contribute to displacement and the methods available to expand tree canopies and park access without causing displacement? Mm -hmm. So absolutely, I think it's an excellent question. So first and foremost, you know, I point to how I mentioned earlier, green spaces are a luxury, right? And unfortunately, we are starting to see that as green spaces are promoted, they are being implemented more in communities that didn't have them historically, right? So you have a kind of duality at the same time. So on one hand, you have places which historically, um, because of them not having as much access to green spaces, they're already lower priced. But when you add the addition of having green spaces, what happens is you have a community that is also lower priced, but still gives you the benefit of green spaces. So for people who are looking to move or but don't want to be priced out in another expensive neighborhood, what can happen is what can happen is that they'll turn to these neighborhoods that are slowly growing and looking better over time and moving into them. But how we have the problems of gentrification and displacement is that people who were longstanding residents and for long periods of time didn't have access to those green spaces, it's almost like as soon as they get added, they can no longer live and stay in those environments because they get priced out, right? Because then we start to see these areas um, which were historically displaced and discriminated against, now they they become luxurious and, and highly sought after, right? Um, and I think the second part of this question is, is a great question as well. It's how do we expand tree canopies and park access without causing displacement? You need to do it in a way that involves the community as a whole and doesn't necessarily and doesn't necessarily cause an influx in high prices, right? So a lot of a lot of communities do this where um, I, I think a great example is Harlem Grown, which are popping up in several locations. So Harlem Grown does a great job at they don't, they don't, it's essentially like they don't charge the community for providing that green services, right? They they mainly provide the community so spaces to where existing members can already take part in the in uh the newly added green space without prices or costs being risen up. So you need to have like organizations that are truly doing it um for the benefit of helping and not just for profit. Because when you have profit-based um organizations, it'll cause the the rental prices to increase. Thank you for answering that question. Mm -hmm. It was it was one that I had as well. Um Adrian asks, what's a good cost of uh, efficient way to start my own green space and what's the best where is the best place to buy plants from <laughs> <laughs> um the most the cost efficient way of getting it from someone else like I said um <laughs> it's not even having to buy it on your own no there are definitely there are definitely techniques um and it's something you have to google but you can trip trim or clone a plant that already exists and start to repot it um if you place it in like a bowl of water it should start to grow roots if you do it the right way um, in some places specifically, I would just say shop local, you know, um, there are a couple, there are a couple of stores. I can't even think of the names, but just, just out and about on the street, you know, help the community, um, give, give back money to, you know, the local area in the community. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Buy local and, and native if you can. Absolutely. Native as well. Um, so Melanie asks, what strategies or initiatives have you come across that have successfully helped create green spaces in urban areas? And how do you think young people can apply those to their own communities? Definitely being active and involved. Um, I work part-time as well um, at John Jay College. And what I see a lot of the environmental club doing is having those connections and going out and actually and going out and actually um participating in the park spaces and the cleanups because this already gets you in the mindset of environmentalism. So it's like once you once you put yourself in the order of maintaining and cleaning up, um, it gives you these ideas of like, oh, this is something that I need to continue with and you'll carry it with you the rest of your life. Yeah, I completely agree. And um, it's something that I think if you're trying to create green spaces in your own community, doing it with your community, like mm -hmm. inviting and onboarding your friends and your family to join you is 
it makes it so much more powerful. You know, you have community mm-hmm. buy-in, you have um, a lot of people working toward the same initiative. I think um, there really is like power in numbers. And so mm-hmm. if you're doing it, like invite your friends to do it with you and, and have that bigger impact. Absolutely. I 100% agree. Um, I have a few, or I have, maybe we'll just end with one question that mm-hmm. I have, if that's okay. Um, so, man, I have two, but I guess you had mentioned that if you have this amazing green space, um, it's not enough just to have it, you have to maintain it. And mm-hmm. there are, you know, there's work involved in that. There's maybe some costs involved in that. What are some strategies that you think would be best used to um, encourage people to do their part to maintain their community green space. Like sometimes I walk past places that might have litter or might have, um, you know, a nutrient pollution problem. And so I'm thinking Mm -hmm. like preventative, like what are some good strategies that we can um, kind of get everyone to take part in? That's a great question because it's very, it's very fundamental, right? Like, it's like, if you already have a green space, you know, you want to take care and best maintain it. Um, But no matter what, I always point to education. I always point back to teaching people and letting them know why it is important to keep these areas clean. Um, Because once they have the knowledge about it, you know, they're more willing to, you know, commit action and, um, and actually do something to help. Yeah, that's so true. I do feel like, um, sometimes if you have a green space you might take it for granted and then Mm -hmm. it it doesn't get maintained but you it really starts with education yeah sometimes Um, we just don't know like i said a a lot of times um with the open community lots that we start to see a lot of people don't know that if those spaces are owned by new york city parks and recreation those are open spaces for all of us to be able to enjoy and and take part in yeah that's that's a really great point Mm -hmm. um Actually, I, I do want to ask this question because it's one that <laughs> I, I think about a lot. And you brought up the the point of having a green space that's really for the community, not one that will um, drive profit because then that can drive, you know, gentrification in a community um, mm. by pricing people out. So do you think there could be a solution or a strategy that um, – like mandates that there's a certain amount of green space in each community because if you think about it these green spaces they're good for your mental health they're good for biodiversity Mm -hmm. they also are helping to provide clean air clean water things Mm -hmm. that i think every human should have a right to have access to so in in many ways it's almost like um should our state or local governments play a role in mandating a certain amount of green space per community. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? I would love to see it, you know, especially as we start to discuss a, a lot more in terms of like this intersection of climate and politics. I feel like I would hope it would be something that, you know, we can come and get out of. Yeah. And mm. then I'm just thinking like it could help preventing, you know, communities that have lived in an area for generations be priced out because all of a sudden they have access to this beautiful park. You know, exactly, everyone exactly. should have access to these things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I um, agree. Awesome. Well, I don't see any other questions. Thank you so much for spending the past 30 minutes with us. It's, it's been <laughs> wonderful hearing about the work that you're doing and, um, and yeah, I hope everyone goes home and, and creates their own green space with their house plants if you haven't already. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Leah. And thank you, um, Laurel. And thank you so much um, for everyone joining and um, participating with me today. I really, really appreciate it. Awesome. All right. Take care, everyone. Yeah.